Welcome to the Yours in Marketing podcast. On this week's episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Fedora Sporting SEO Royalty, aka Cyrus Shepard. Cyrus is the founder of Zippy.com, and he's also a self-made SEO mastermind, most notably known for his time as the director of audience development at Moz. Here's what you're going to get out of this episode. First off, we talk about how to start a career in something you know nothing about. Then we kind of move on to the dynamics of working at a company versus working for yourself. We also talk about the future of SEO. And here's a hint. It's about the people, people. Building a social following is also something that we're going to talk about here on the podcast or building a brand for yourself or for your company. And then finally, the principles of fine cinema. Yes, that actually does come up. Just a reminder to please leave an honest review for the Yours in Marketing podcast. Each and every week from now on, I'll be shouting out one of our new reviewers by name on the podcast. We'll randomly select a name of the reviews we accrue during the week and we'll shout you out. So if you feel like getting famous, please leave a review. We would love to shout you out. Enough fanfare. Let's get to the interview. All right. So with us today... We have SEO extraordinaire Cyrus Shepard. He is one of the biggest names in SEO. He is an absolute expert beast on the matter, but also he's just a really cool guy. So we're, we're going to get to know Cyrus a little bit better. So Cyrus, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me. What people listening don't know is I missed this interview a couple of times. <laughs> Previously, I was struck with a concussion about a month and a half ago. So I've been recovering, but so I'm really happy that we made it today and uh, happy to be here. I appreciate your vigilance. I know it's not easy to, to overcome something like that, but all that matters is that we're here now, right? Absolutely. So let's start with this because given that it's March, are you a sports fan? Are you doing a March Madness bracket? I feel sort of embarrassed by this, but I have become less and less of a sports fan every year. In college, I was crazy about March Madness. I did all the brackets. You know, I watched every game. Over time, I've just become less of a sports guy. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about with sports people, but it's just the reality of the matter. So no bracket this year? No bracket. I don't even know who the good teams are anymore. Well, I'll just spoil it for you. Duke's going to win it. They, nobody else has a chance. Yeah. Duke's so nothing win. has changed in 20 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> You've got that absolutely right. <laughs> and so you went to USC, right? For That's college. Right. You got a degree in cinema and production. I'm not reading that wrong. I got in on my own merits. I did not pay to get in. Uh, I did not take my <laughs> SAT scores. So, yes. Yeah, I studied cinema at USC. It was, a, it was a great experience. I never really used my cinema degree. I worked in Hollywood as a like background actor for a few years. I was trying to be a writer. My most not- noticeable gig was, uh, have you heard of the show 24? Yeah. For Sutherland? I was a one of the regular background actors in in the office there in this in the counterterrorism <laughs> unit, and I just walk around wearing the same clothes every day because you know it all happens in a twenty four hour period. Right. <laughs> and then we'd go sit in a room with the other actors. It was a great job. That's fantastic. So when you were in school, was the plan to become an actor, to become a director, to become a writer, or did you always think that it was going to lead somewhere else? Uh, I wanted to become a director, a writer director. I love movies. I still do. I'm a huge devotee of Steven Spielberg cinema, you know, of the uh, eighties and nineties, but yeah, I really had no talent as a screenwriter. And I spent 10 years banging my head against the wall, trying to, you know, get uh, scripts produced in Hollywood. And I was really not a good screenwriter at all. So it it was a weird career choice for me. (laughs) Well, so you're writing these scripts you feel like you don't have the talent. So at what point did you just decide like, or what made the switch of, all right, I just need to stop this and and go for something else. It was actually a small taste of success. I had uh, finally gotten an agent to be interested in me. There are these screenwriting competitions that they have in, in Hollywood and they're, they're mostly bogus, but they can give you a little recognition. And I actually placed like third or fourth place in the screenwriting competition, which was a huge deal. And it should have been a validation moment for me because I was finally getting getting my foot in the door. But I had worked so hard to get to that point. And writing had become so scripted, for a better word. Like I, It was almost like I was following a formula. I was doing what, what I knew would work instead of what I was loving to do. 
And I was so exhausted at that point. I'm like, if this was what it takes to succeed, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm not enjoying it. This was too much work. I've spent 10 years of my life getting to this point and I hate it now. So I just, one day I just told my wife I'm done and I, I never went back. So what was the next step after that? Where, where'd you go? Uh, so then I was completely lost. So I was supporting myself with these dead end jobs, waiting tables, uh, bartending, uh, firefighting, the background acting none of them with benefits or insurance or, you know, I basically had no money. I was basically broke. My wife was just finishing a second degree. And at that point, we decided to move to Seattle for no, no reason whatsoever. And uh, I got to Seattle and I started to, I didn't know what else to do. And I was taking more dead end jobs. This was in the uh, recession 10 years ago. Uh, it was at terrible economic times. And I got a job. It was another dead end job in a restaurant I was being trained by a 19 year old kid who was more interested in eating soup than, you know, doing anything else. <laughs> and uh, after three days of this job, uh, my wife came and picked me up and I said, uh, honey, I, I know times are tough. I know the economy is rough. I'm going to quit this job and I'm going to try to make a living doing something on the Internet. And that's how I got into SEO. That's a huge leap of faith. <laughs> it is. That must have been terrifying. It was. I had been studying, you know, I've been interested in websites for a long time and uh, building websites. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I was building HTML websites and I didn't know what my plan was, but uh, I literally had a, an HTML book that I was going through. And that, that was my business plan. I was going to go through the HTML book and somehow magic was going to happen. And, and it kind of did in a way. It kind of did. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds like a really fun book to read. Just straight up <laughs> HTML. <Yeah. laughs> I've taken a couple classes on HTML and I, you know, it's, it's useful, but it's not the most exciting of material. Yeah. So seamless segue here. I've got to ask so many of your pictures out there, like when you're giving events, doing, do, you're giving speeches, you're sporting the fedora. Oh yeah. 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 So why the fedora? What's the origin story of the fedora and what's the future of the fedora as well? Let's talk about this. So the, the origin story is I went bald and I hate it. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I went, I, I started losing my hair at, you know, uh, 21 years old. I had so much hair. It was beautiful. <laughs> you know, I did all the supplements, all the Rogaine and everything to try to hold on to it. You know, it was just, it was just pathetic. I did 10 years where it's really thin on top, but I'm still growing it. And it got to the point where like, this is ridiculous. So I started shaving my head about uh, four or five years ago and uh, started wearing a hat, just a ball cap, but I'm advancing in age and respectability. So I uh, started buying nice hats once in a while and having a lot of fun with them. The fedora is one of the few hats that you can wear in a professional setting that's acceptable. Absolutely. And when I go to conferences, when I, uh, I do a lot of emceeing of SEO conferences. It's nice to wear the hat. They're terrible to travel with on planes because you can't pack them. And then, you know, in a lot of places in Europe, it's not polite to wear a hat indoors, but still, I love the hats. <laughs> and so before we move on to more of the SEO side, I have a couple questions about your cinema background still. Yeah. So now that we talked about your, your love for movies, I have a couple questions around this because I also love movies. Don't want to spend too much time, but thoughts on the Oscars this year. Green Book, was it deserving? It was possibly deserving, but I don't think it was the best movie of the field. And I, I remember years ago when um, I was rooting for Saving Private Ryan to win and Shakespeare in Love won uh, because Saving Private Ryan was competing against uh, Thin Blue Line. Terrence Malick. And, you know, it split the vote. Now they have this stacked ranking system that's supposed to, you know, reward second choice. I don't know exactly how it works, but no, I don't think Green Book was the best film of last year, but. I agree with you. Uh, what about the no host situation? You were cool with that? Yeah, I was totally cool with that. Doing, doing a lot of emceeing myself, I don't think there's any reason that you need a continual host throughout the whole program. Last year at MozCon, uh, they asked me to host, but we split it up with three different hosts one day after another, and that worked great. And I think you can even do more than that. It's a it's a great opportunity to bring more people on stage. Yeah, it was it's, it was quicker. 
It was nice. I do want to give a shout out to my uh, USC classmate, Eric Adele, who uh, was nominated for sound on A Quiet Space. They did not win. Whoa. Yeah, uh, they did not win. He's going to get the Oscar, though, someday. Yeah, no, that that movie was incredible. That was like one of those movies you have to see in theaters, though, yeah. to have the full effect. But that, that was an incredible movie. And so if you could win any Oscar, your dream Oscar, which one would it be? It would be for directing. It would be directing the best picture. <laughs> You'd have to beat out Alfonso Cuaron. He yeah, wins it like okay. every year now. Yeah, he's he's so good. He's so good. <laughs> yeah. And and then you mentioned also that Spielberg is like, that's your guy. Yeah. So number one Spielberg movie of all time. Oh, Private Ryan. There's so many, but I the one that I'm in love with is Jaws. That's a fantastic movie. It just continues to deliver. It's so old now, but it just every shot is intentional. And you can learn so much just watching it. And it, it's amazing to me that directors in the decades since have not really taken the lessons of Spielberg to heart. And they're just putting cameras anywhere and, and shooting scenes like they have for, for decades without really understanding they can do it like this and do it better. Well, I just being a movie lover like you, I just had to ask a couple of those questions, but I think it's also a little bit pertinent because like too often in B2B marketing, whatever space you're in, we focus too much on the business side of it, but then like we're all people. We all have interests. It's okay to have fun as well. So hopefully that, that comes across here. But like Cyrus is, is clearly talking to him. It's just a cool guy. So what's what's your, I got to ask you, what's your favorite film? Okay, so this is a little bit of a probably a dark horse for most people. They, they would never think of this movie. But my personal favorite movie of all time is The Green Mile. The, I love The Green Mile. I love that movie. It's got great villains in it. It's it's like got this really nice side of it, this really evil side. Of it. It's just like really well composed, I think. I I love that movie. Who directed that? I have no clue who directed it. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. The same guy who did Shawshank Redemption. I think so, yeah. Tom Hanks, Michael Clark Duncan, really good movie. Yep. yep. Yeah. Underrated for sure. Underappreciated. Yeah. Not underrated, underappreciated. Yeah, I, it's one of the few Stephen King books turned movies that actually turned out well. That's it's yep. not often that that like turns out to be a good movie, but that one's great. Yeah, cool. So let's shift a little bit. Let's get a little bit more into your path. Obviously, we talked about it's been really untraditional, but your transition into SEO, like what was your first exposure? You mentioned getting into HTML first. Then how did you transition into the whole SEO side of websites? I got incredibly lucky on so many fronts in my career. I hate it when we see successful people who take credit for their success by saying, it was me, it was all my brains, my luck. I have no brains or, or any of that. It was all luck for me. So I, I quit the restaurant business. I was building websites. I was building uh, some affiliate sites, you know, as people did back in 2008, 2009. And uh, I needed to figure out how to market them. And I had no clue how to market them. So I was like Googling how to how to get visitors to your website. You know, when I was, you know, running into AdWords and, you know, I started out greener than green. And then I stumbled upon SEO and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to push people a message. I can wait until people are looking for something. And if I know what they're looking for, I can place my content directly in front of them at the moment that they were looking for them. This was magic to me. I had had some really bad sales jobs in high school where I would call people up, you know, telemarketing, selling them coupon books, selling coupon books to little old ladies who absolutely didn't need them. And I, I felt horrible about myself. They were terrible jobs. So this is what I thought that selling was. So when I discovered SEO, it was like light bulbs started clicking off in my head and uh, I was in love. That moment turned everything for me. It's not that common that somebody will find something like SEO. Some people, if you explain that to them, that could be super boring, right? I'm yeah. an SEO as well. That's that's like my my specialty. But I understand when I talk to people about SEO that aren't in marketing at all, it's a snooze fest. They don't care. So how can people just like become passionate about something that other people find boring? And how, how do you stick with it? There was no question for me about sticking with it just because 
I loved it so much. And this is a question I have today because SEO is changing so much and Google is changing the landscape. I suspect SEO is not going to look the same in 10 years as, as it does today. So that, that raises some questions to me about how to stay relevant and uh, how is this job that we're, we're doing of making websites more visible and helping people connect with customers and visitors? How is that going to change? So when I was doing this, when I was learning SEO, I was really green. My wife was working for a uh, wholesale wine accessory company here in Seattle, and she loved the job. They were doing millions of dollars a year in business. I looked at their website and it was horrible. It was horrible. They had one page indexed in Google. This this was a million dollar company that had one page indexed in Google because <laughs> uh, their homepage was, you know, an image. All the other pages were set to no index. I mean, I was it was terrible. So I, I asked my wife, set up a meeting with your boss. I just want to point out a few of these issues that I'm learning about. So I had a meeting with him. I went in, I, I prepared like 10 slides. Here's 10 things you can do. And I, I just wanted to help the business out because my wife worked there. I uh, just wanted to do him a favor. And we got done. He's like, that's awesome. How much do you charge? I'm like, oh, oh no, no, I'm not. I'm just a beginner. I, I, I barely know this stuff. And he's like, well, obviously, you know more than I do. So how much do you charge? And I went, well, OK. So we set up a contract and I became their consultant. And it was my first SEO consultant job. I had no idea what I was doing, but they gave me total control of the website. Over the next two years, you know, we drew millions of dollars of revenue. The site was so unoptimized. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. All we, you know, just redid the homepage and, you know, they were doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And then I ran into a problem. I ran into a problem like a lot of SEOs run into. Business was doing great, but they didn't understand why. They didn't understand that it was coming from SEO, that more businesses were, more business was coming through the website. And so I'm like, I need more clients. I need to charge more money. This has been a great learning experience. So I started searching for, you know, different SEO opportunities. And I stumbled upon Moz, which was SEO Moz back in those days. And they were hiring for some, you know, SEO customer support. I was kind of an entry level SEO in those days. I applied. I got the job. It was awesome. And three months later, they promoted me to lead SEO of the company. Uh, so in a very <laughs> in a very short time, I went from you know just learning SEO to doing SEO for the the number one SEO company in the world. And it was I had imposter syndrome out the wazoo. <laughs> but that's how I got started in SEO. It was just an incredible series of fortune. I'm, I'm sure there are other people listening that have had that experience. Maybe not to that extent, like at, at a Moz type company, but going from entry level to all of a sudden being asked to do so much. What advice would you give to somebody that's going through that right now, or that will go through that in the future? How do you get over the imposter syndrome and actually become great? Let me tell you about imposter syndrome. So shortly after I started at Mods, within the first week, they put me in this position. Well, we met with the growth team of Facebook. So I'm in a conference room with VP level people at Facebook, and we're going over how can Facebook improve their SEO? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there going, a few months ago, I was doing this wine <laughs> website, you know, you know, on the side. And we have this page up and it's like, uh, it's like Britney Spears or something like that. And I'm like, why is Twitter outranking this page? And it was, it was a weird situation. And I'm looking at it and it was obvious to me why the page wasn't ranking. Uh, there was very little content on the page. It was just an issue of basic SEO techniques, practices. I realized at that moment, you know, SEO is done one page at a time. It's an algorithm. Everything is treated according to a set set of rules. And if you can do SEO for a wine website, you can start to understand principles of SEO for Facebook or Twitter or any website in the world. And you have the skills to do that. The principles don't change. That was kind of a turning point for me sitting in that room that, you know, maybe, maybe I actually could do this. And if I can do this, anybody can do this. What were your first impressions when you got to Moz? What did you perceive as, as your reality there? What the company was like at that point? Everybody there was my hero. You know, Rand Fishkin and, and Jen Lopez and uh, Danny Dover back in the days who wrote the web developer's cheat sheet. So I was just in awe walking around the hallways and, and running into oh, people. I rode an elevator with Rand uh, Fishkin and I was so nervous that I couldn't say anything. I was just like, ah. <laughs> I froze up. 
the most surprising thing to me was that the people there at that time, you know, Sarah Bird, who's now the CEO, they were so much nicer in real life than they were online. And I thought that was incredible because they were so nice online. Yeah. But in person, they were amazing. And uh, I'm still friends with several of them today. And they're just some of the best people I know. Do you have any good Rand Fishkin stories? I, I my lips, lips are sealed. Are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recently just read through his, his new book, Lost and Founder. It was really, really cool book. What people don't realize about Rand, and I, I don't mind speaking about him in third person. He's the real deal. We've become pretty good friends over the years, and he is so passionate and so genuine. What he professes to be online is who he is as a person 110%. There's no pretension there. There's no posturing. Obviously, he's a giant in the SEO world, but as you were talking about, you know, SEOs are real people. He is one of the most real people uh, that I know. Is it weird to you that nowadays CEOs are celebrities? The tech industry, like especially in the Valley, like they can become celebrities. Like Rand Fishkin can walk around and people will know who Rand Fishkin is because he does videos on Whiteboard Fridays and he ran Moz. Whereas back in the day, it was like the actors were famous. Like that's still the case. But is that weird to you? Yeah, it is a little weird. Social media is such a weird place that it can amplify anybody. There's a corollary phenomenon that is also disturbing, which is social media can amplify sure. anybody. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so if you're good at social media, you know, trolls and people who are totally undeserving of the attention, uh, anybody can pose as a successful SEO on Twitter. And I, I, I think we see that. And it's hard to separate people who are giving, you know, good actionable advice uh, from people who are just good at amplifying themselves. Right. Yeah. It's kind of hard to sift through the, uh, like social media just makes it so easy to put out information. You can say I've got 20 years of experience and I've, I've done X results, but like, can you back it up? And have you, have you really put in the work? Like how many people have really put in the work to be able to say those things that speaks also to kind of, I mean, I'd love to get your opinion on this, but where SEO is going in the future as well, just in terms of everything is supposed to be more genuine. Like it's going from being more and more natural, more and more genuine, more towards user experience than it is about just implementing tactics. I mean, am I, am I speaking the truth here? Yeah. So, so I ran a poll a couple of days ago on, on Twitter and I asked people what they found the hardest part of SEO was. Uh, and the answers really surprised me. The four choices were technical SEO, content creation, link building and outreach and buy-in. And the two biggest problems that people had were content creation and link building and PR outreach. And that is a problem, no matter how Google changes, uh, no matter what technical problems there are, that's going to be a problem that never goes away. That's been marketing since uh, the dawn of time. How do we create messages that resonate with people and how do we amplify those messages? I think that's going to continue to be the, the future of SEO. The platforms are going to change. The tech is going to change. Best practices are going to change. But creating, crafting those messages that resonate, mm -hmm. that's something that we continually have to learn over and over and over again and try to be good at. Along with this, you recently spoke about the new release of Domain Authority 2.0. You actually wrote the, the article about it, right? I, I wrote one of the articles. I, I don't want to take any credit. The Domain Authority... Russ Jones and some very smart search scientists at Moz had worked on that. I just came in the end and was a messenger, right. <laughs> uh, did one whiteboard, did, yeah, did one whiteboard Friday. Uh, but we had many multiple streams uh, going through that. Yeah. So from Domain Authority 1.0 to 2.0, from what we've just said, trying to make it more resonate with the messaging more with the user, make it more user friendly, more natural. How does Domain Authority 2.0 fit into that? How does it reflect that? The original Domain Authority. There's what domain authority is, and there's the marketing myth, what people think domain authority is. And so it's this huge metric that's used by tens or hundreds of thousands of people out there in the world. And from a marketing point of view, it's very challenging to communicate how people should be using it when it's that broadly adopted. I think anytime you have a technology platform or metric or software that's used by that many people, Different people are going to see different things. 
So Domain Authority 1.0 was loosely based on Google's PageRank algorithm. There was a little bit of machine learning that looked at Google search results. And the, the main use of Domain Authority is trying to predict Google right. rankings. How authoritative is this website? Over time, it kind of got uh, not out of date, but there were opportunities there to make it much, much better. So the new Domain Authority 2.0 takes spam into account. It takes people who are manipulating the link graph into the account. It's much more reflective of actual Google rankings. Uh, and they did they use some very, very clever things to do that. And it remains the most predictive domain level metric out there. So getting that message out about what, what it is used for and what it isn't used for has been challenging and fun. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that it's like a Google metric and it's not. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, if I get my DA up, then I'll get guaranteed like Google's going to rank yeah. me higher. It's like, well, it's not Google's metric, <laughs> but it's a complicated messaging because if you do raise your domain authority, chances are you are actually going to rank higher. But there's it's not because Google is using that. It's because Google is using we're using the same signals that Google is using. They just happen to, you know, right. overlap. it's definitely worth optimizing for. But it's hard for people to understand. Uh, well, if I raise this up, then it's Google. Google's going to reward me. It's like, no. You still got to put in the work. Yeah. <laughs> but you've been given so many cool opportunities with a company like Moz to do to work on things like this, so many other things, to conferences. So what led to – you still have a relationship clearly with Moz. You, you've done Whiteboard Fridays with them still and stuff. But what led to deciding, all right, I'm going to try to move away from the nest a little bit and start my own thing? Uh, yeah, so – I left Moz, I think, in 2015. My wife and I started our own business, which was Bazillion. That's the corporate name. We had some website, mostly affiliate marketing type stuff, also some consulting on the side, uh, which we've enjoyed immensely. I stepped away a little bit from that last year due to some family health issues that, you know, everybody experiences, you know, in their life. So I had sort of basically taken a break and Towards the end of last year, I had a couple of offers from some companies in the SEO space to do some contracting consulting to come on and help them out. And Moz here in Seattle, we worked out an agreement. So now I'm doing some uh, consulting with Moz. So I'm not an employee of Moz. They are a customer at this point. I don't know the length of this relationship. We have a set term in our contract, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of things that I love working with a lot of the people there right now creating some content, advising on some things. And uh, it's fun to still have a relationship with them. What was the key driver behind like wanting to do your own thing and leaving a company like Moz? Uh, I really hate working for other people. Got <laughs> so, <it. laughs> uh, I've worked for some awesome people and I've worked for some awesome people at Moz, but I really value my independence and the difference between being in-house and working for yourself any SEO who's ever worked in a company knows the frustration of wanting to change something on a website and not being able to do it right away, having to put a ticket in, talk to the engineering team, argue about resource allocation. It's so wonderful not to have those constraints and just build your own websites. I've been publishing a little bit of content over the past year on zippy.com. We've only published three articles, but those three articles got tens of thousands of visits, you know, maybe in the hundreds of thousands at this point. And that's so refreshing just to have complete control over every step that you do. Uh, I'm kind of a control freak. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love that. I think a lot of people that do their own thing will relate to being a control freak. That's probably yeah. a common theme. What were the challenges, though? Like, if you had to do something differently from that transition, what would that be? I'm fascinated by the psychology of successful entrepreneurs uh, because I don't think I have some of those traits. My friend Rand Fishkin, uh, name drop. he's definitely you pick up that yeah. name you dropped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not dropping him. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my good, my good friend. Uh, yeah, my good friend Elon Musk the other day. Was, 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 uh, <laughs> No, go but go I, for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rand, Rand is so driven and so wired for success. And I'm always wondering, like, what's the difference between him and me? Because I'm I don't have a lot of those traits that a lot of successful entrepreneurs have. Uh, there was a study done a few years ago about personality traits, uh, uh, cognitive distortions of entrepreneurs. And I and I see those those traits in a lot of entrepreneurs. They include black and white thinking personal exceptionalism, things that 
can sometimes lead to depression and mental disorders also lead to very high success rates in Silicon Valley. So I'm trying to figure out myself what personality traits I need to work on without going into psychosis or depression <laughs> to, to balance success sure. um, with my personal drives. That's a huge thing to, that like we need to focus on that a little bit more just in general as a society, but also in business, the, the mental health aspect of it. It's, it's so important to keep it in mind because the more stressed out you get, obviously, the, the more that's going to affect your work. And so when you're, when you're doing something like moving from Moz to doing your own thing, you're going to have control over everything, which is great because then you don't report to anybody. But then at the same time, you have control over everything, which means if you fail or if something doesn't go exactly as planned, all of the stress is on you. The whole burden is on you. So how do you manage that? I'll be honest, uh, over the past few years since leaving Moz, I've had a wonderful time. I've had lots of opportunities. I've done SEO with some great sites. I've done my own projects. And then when, you know, I, I took some time off last year uh, because of some family reasons, you know, it was, it was incredibly easy for me. I had that opportunity. But one thing I, I haven't done on my own is I haven't really built a business. I have an income. Uh, you know, I have consulting that I do and I have projects uh, that I make money off of, but I, I haven't built a business. And I think that's the next step for me is building an actual business that uh, can run on its own, that has inputs and outputs, and that doesn't necessarily need me at the seat every day. And I think that's a challenge I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. So that now you're doing a company called Zippy. Yep. Let's talk about Zippy for a second. Why on earth did you call it Zippy? How did that come about? <laughs> and and what do you do? I'm fascinated with naming things and what works and what resonates. And I saw Zippy on a domain marketplace. It was a premium domain. Uh, I won't tell you how much I paid for it. It might be embarrassing. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it hit all the triggers for me. It, 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 it had Zip. It was short. It was brandable. There wasn't a lot out there like it. So I, I got it. And I was love at first sight. And my wife is a one of the most talented graphic designers I know. We worked for a few weeks coming up with a logo for it. I love the I love the the colors, the identity, the branding. I love everything about it. What was the key service that you were wanting to what what did you want to do differently with it? Why why was this supposed to stand out? What most people don't know is Zippy is actually a stealth software company. I had this idea for creating a new type of SEO software, something that doesn't exist in the marketplace. I can't speak too much about it. Been working with a developer for the past year and a half. We've come up with some creative solutions. We're not we're not close to launching anything yet, but Zippy is actually was created for that reason. And since we've had it, we've we've used it to uh, publish some content to build some attention around the brand, so that when we do launch, if and when we do launch the software, <laughs> uh, we have that brand equity already built in. You also do consulting through this brand, though. Is that right? Yes. There's some weird <laughs> things around business. My consulting is actually through a company called Fazillion, which is a parent umbrella company. But yeah, it's basically Zippy. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So talking about consulting, one of the key things that comes to mind, because I've, I've done some consulting on my own as well before coming here to Directive. And the thing that was hardest for me, I guess, is the fact that you have to be okay with one to one in your time, like the time that you put in is the exact amount of income that you're going to get out of it. Whereas yeah. you turn it into a software company and all of a sudden you can exponentially grow, which is kind of like what Moz did. They started out doing consulting, then they turned it into this software. And now people don't know Moz for their consulting nearly as much as they know it for their software. So is that kind of the goal here? Yeah. Uh, so I was originally an affiliate marketer and I love that because you it's the idea of scale. You you make money in your sleep. The business runs, you know, 24 seven and consulting. When I first joined Moz, I didn't really understand the software business at all. I just wanted to do SEO. I was in love with SEO. I didn't even care that Moz had software. Uh, I didn't understand that part of the business. But when you work in software for a while, you understand, you know, that margins are so much better and the scale is so much better when you actually and also marketing becomes easier when you're when you're an affiliate marketer you don't own the product. You're kind of on the side and you're promoting someone else's product and you don't have that control. But 
when you sell software, it's your product. And marketing something that is real is so much easier than marketing something that belongs to somebody else that everybody else is trying to market and you're trying to differentiate it or marketing a service that is, you know, marketing your time as a consultant, marketing a real product that people can buy and subscribe to is awesome. I love marketing real products. Also, I love software. I love SEO. So that's why I love Zippy. <laughs> Full circle there. Yeah. <laughs> well, so based off of your career so far, if you had to give one piece of advice to current B2B leaders to build your online presence right now, if you start it over from scratch, because you're big on Twitter, you obviously, when you create content, you know how to do it right. You can get tens of thousands of visitors to something. So if you were starting all over, what advice would you give to a B2B leader on how to do that? That's a great question. I, because I think it is still so easy to create a presence for yourself on social media. I share articles all the time on Twitter, and there's so few people that are sharing original content or original research. It is so easy to do an SEO experiment. There's so many things you can test and publish the results. Those things get so much attention. They they are shared. They're put in newsletters. People see you on, on Twitter. It's still so easy to gain attention to yourself because nobody is doing the hard work of publishing original research, publishing original thoughts, putting things useful out there. Uh, and if you do that, I think you can build a name for yourself fairly quickly. So you're, you're telling me that there's you have to actually do hard work, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can just be a... You can just be annoying. See, I, uh, I, 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 see, <laughs> I see people on Twitter doing that. Too. You should see my mute list. It is pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> I imagine. Man, I, I was really looking for just like an easy way to, to do this. Just tack it, yeah. you know, but it looks like I'm going to have to do some hard work here. Yeah, I was sorry about that. <laughs> well, I think that it would behoove everybody in B2B to try to build their presence up by putting in that work. Thought yeah. leadership is pretty, pretty underrated and something that I, you've kind of built a foundation on. Like people know who you are. We know about the, the fedora. We know about the SEO because you put yourself out there and you put in the work and, and you actually write, you talk, you do events. And I know SEO, but you know, you can be a thought leader in any industry. Just share your knowledge, share best practices. If you're selling consulting services in any industry, the best way to get customers is to tell everybody all of your secrets. And you don't lose business by telling people your secrets because people want you to do the implementation. So uh, share everything you know, and it's it, it can lead to good things. I agree with that. Something I saw with my own consulting is when I just gave everything away for free on social media, like here's what I do in this situation. I'll just give that advice away for free. Then people look at that and they say, if that's the information this guy's giving away for free, imagine what he would give me if I paid him. Yeah. And that's, it's really powerful. And I think we underestimate the power of free knowledge. And that's why there are so many reasons right there, like Backlinko with Brian Dean, he just gives everything away for free. But then people also sign up for all of his courses and everything because they know that if that's what's free, the paid stuff's going to be really good. Brian is a hero of mine. He's he's absolutely amazing. He puts out better SEO content than anybody. And God, he is productive, man. I I, I think he's cloned himself three times. I can I can I can't do that. He he just put out another article yesterday about e-commerce SEO. Yeah. I think he he put out another ultimate guide like last week. I, I, it takes yeah. me so long to write a blog. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. guy's a genius. <laughs> yeah, he certainly is. But like that guy came from nothing as well. He was not in SEO his whole life. I guess that just speaks to the fact that just like your story, if there's something that you become interested in that you want to take a flyer on, you can do it. You can build a career out of it. I, I started young, so thankfully that was the case for me, but I, I still believe it's not too late to get in on this, especially with SEO. It's just going to constantly be changing and improving. So, Absolutely. The fundamental problems of SEO, gaining visibility for your platform is never going to change. The tactics are going to change, but the fundamentals are, are always going to be there. All right. I've got a couple rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Let's let's do a, a, a little segment here at the end. Rapid fire questions for Cyrus Shepard. All right. Number one, let's try to do hot potato as fast as you can. What's your preferred way of publishing content? Blog, video, podcast, social media. Blog, second video. Ooh. Okay. So podcast is, uh, is lower on the list. I see how it is. Hey, 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 there. <laughs> oh, 
podcast are awesome. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I get it. <laughs> All right. If you had to gift one book to one of your friends right now, what book would you give? Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> He's looking around. Is <laughs> what are my favorite books? Uh, okay, I'll just I'll I'll cheat and say Why We Sleep, uh, which is what I'm reading right now. Fascinating book on sleep. Who is that by? I don't even know. Uh, a Harvard professor who's really smart. <laughs> All right, I want to do one last little thing with you. Do you remember what your very first tweet was ever? I don't remember the exact wording, but I was working at Moz and a requirement for working at Moz was setting up a Twitter account. So it was something about my first day at Moz. Yeah. All right. I'll read it to you here if you if, okay. you, if you don't mind. I'll have a follow up as well. So first tweet ever by Cyrus Shepard reads a lonely day at the SEO Moz office. Thank goodness for at Aaron Wheeler and his music to help keep me company. All yeah, right. I remember it was lonely because it was a rare Seattle snowstorm and no one came in the office, but I was so excited <laughs> to work there. I showed up. <laughs> what What was the music? What were you jamming to? Do you uh, remember? I have. I cannot read. That was too many years ago. Can't recall. <laughs> well, let's see. What year was that? 2009? Probably 2010, 2011. Yeah. All right. Definitely not Nirvana. Maybe Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> I, I don't know. Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That is all the questions that I have for you right now, but hopefully we get to do this again sometime. It was good meeting you, uh, e-meeting you. <laughs> also, I want to give you a chance to shout out your companies, anything you're working on, and then uh, we can include it in the show notes as well. All right. So uh, I would give a shout out to uh, Moz because uh, doing some great work with them right now. And, uh, of course, Zippy, which will have some new content on there soon. And uh, I don't have anything to shout out, but I, I'll shout out my wife, Dawn, because I love her. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good husband right there. She's standing right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. I got it. <laughs> so, again, that's Zippy.com. Zippy with two Ys, two P's. Z-Y-P-P-Y dot right. yeah. com. Yeah. Go check it out, read the content, and then we'll be on the lookout for what comes next with Zippy. That's exciting, but uh, it's a little mysterious. We have no clue what's happening. Yeah, no, no clue. No clue. <laughs> Who knows? All right, Cyrus, it's a pleasure, and thank you so much for coming on. And now it's time to switch from a B2B mindset to P2P, that is peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm going to be interviewing people here at Directive Consulting, my peers, my colleagues, to try to find out what makes them tick, to see where they come from, what their goals are professionally, and give you an idea of what the culture is like here at Directive. It's going to be a really interesting opportunity, and maybe you'll even find people that have your exact same job title, your same position, or your same goals, or maybe they just like the same music as you. Okay, this is P2P, peer-to-peer, -peer, where we are talking today with coworker Ashton Meisner, who sits right next to me at Directive. Ashton, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Ashton basically begged me to come and do this interview. I've been dying to be here. <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> Ashton was kind of like one of the first people that I met at Directive because I sit right next to her. Uh, she's in the marketing department. So why don't you tell us what your title is, what you do on a daily basis, and then we will reverse engineer it back to where you got your start. Cool. Yeah. So I'm the media relations and marketing manager here at Directive. Um, I actually started out as an SEO specialist, um, diving into the back end and learning more about the technical side, which was different for me coming from a PR background. So that was how I kind of got started here at Directive. And I had an opportunity to, as we expanded, take on the marketing role and really build the brand here. Um, I do a lot of outreach for media relations, um, getting Garrett on different podcasts, which is cool so we can share his knowledge um, and running our content marketing initiative where everyone here at Directive writes um, articles where we share expertise and we've been sharing that with different outlets um, digitally. So it's been pretty cool. That's kind of a glimpse into what I do, the marketing media side. All right. So let's go back in time. Yes. You went to school at Arizona State. Yes. Go Devs. Go Devils. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, what'd you graduate in? And then we'll kind of go into directly after college, what happened? Yeah, so I actually originally started as a broadcast journalism major. My dream was to be an ESPN sports reporter. 
And then I started learning more about the lifestyle. Wasn't super for me. And I learned more about PR and how everything's going digital. So I was like, that would that would just be a better opportunity, I think, if I ever wanted to move around or stay close to home, whatever that looks like. I had some security. So yes, ended up graduating journalism, PR, um, journalism with an emphasis in PR. And after I graduated, I had a role with Arizona Diamondbacks where I worked in the community relations department, which was really great working with all the nonprofits, um, being able to work with the players for cool events. And um, it was really busy sports. It sounds all glamorous, but it's very, um, you know, you're, there's a lot of things that go on on the weekends and all that good stuff. But it was so fun. I'm a huge baseball fan. So I got to do that for a year. And then I was able to obtain the position of marketing coordinator at Camelback Ranch, which is the spring training home of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And Stop there for yeah, a sec. I want to ask some questions here because I love baseball too. Yes, cool. I grew up playing baseball and awesome. it's, it was like my favorite sport growing up. Yeah. So uh, working for the Diamondbacks. Yes. Name a player that you met. Yes. That somebody listening might recognize. Paul Goldschmidt was amazing, but he's gone now, which is so sad because I'm a, I'm a big Diamondbacks fan. Um, but he was awesome, so great with the kids, and always he was so busy. He's like an amazing player, but he'd always take time to be at the charity events and stuff, which is really cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was my experience there, um, and then so I started working with Camelback Ranch, which was. You had the L.A. Dodgers side and then the Chicago White Sox side, which was so fun because they're so different, both teams. So I got to kind of work um, with both and we had our own office as well. Um, and I would help run the game script. I actually did a little bit of the broadcasting down in the field. We do this big dice game and I'd be like, hey, come down. We have John on the first base or whatever. So that was kind of fun. And I had my own team of geez, like 12 interns. So that was the promo team that ran around. And I kind of just ran that initiative, which is cool with um, two of my colleagues. So that was fun. So some people would say like, that sounds like a dream job. So yeah. why are you here now versus there? Yeah. What changed? So in all honesty, that was, it was an amazing position. And I loved being there in the spring and everything, but because it was spring training, we didn't, it wasn't a full time position. So I would be there, I'd get there in December, we'd be done in April after the season ended. Um, and I had the opportunity to stay, but I'd have to get another job. And I was just kind of in a weird place, didn't know if I wanted to move from Arizona. Um, so I ended up applying for just different jobs in different states to see, and I ended up getting a PR job out here in Orange County. And so that's kind of how I got here. So I did leave the world of sports, which I love so much, but I'm like, well, maybe I need to build some, you know, just learn a little bit more and then maybe I'll come back to sports down the road. I didn't know. I was kind of in a weird spot, um, but I did. That's how I did get out here. And then that was the position I had before I ended up here at Directive. So, yeah. Well, how'd you find out about Directive? Who interviewed you? Yeah. What drew you to the position and why, yeah. are you, why are you here now? Well, what's funny is I was kind of in a, I, I don't, I don't know. I was looking for something new and my um, fiance, he, one of his colleagues, he was mentioning how, well, he had mentioned to him how I was looking for a new job. And he said, um, she works in marketing, right? She should look at directive. They have incredible company culture. And I was like, oh, that's what I'm looking for. Like something really, you know, where I just love going to work every day, meeting these people and so I applied for a directive and it was a little bit different out of my wheelhouse. You know, I'm used to doing all the media, the sports, like all that thing, all those, all that side, I guess. And, um, this was definitely a more technical role. And so I thought I'm like, maybe we'll just go and see. And I met Tanner and Garrett and they were so great. Um, really passionate about what they do. And that's kind of how I like to show up every day, just be there with a purpose. So, um, I was like, well, this is an opportunity to learn something completely different. And I accepted the role. We, they had just moved to this new office, which was kind of exciting. Um, and I became an SEO specialist. And this was how long ago? This was last, the end of July. So like, yeah, the very beginning of August. So not, okay. Yeah. Cool. So not too long ago. And then I was able to kind of go back into my comfort zone of marketing, which I love. And it's been incredible ever since then. 
Yeah. And then, so you work like crazy. I see this. But then also when you leave here, yes. you work like crazy. I do. <laughs> so what do you do when you leave? Yes. So it's a different kind of work. Um, I actually am a yoga instructor part time at Core Power, which is really great. I get to do kind of both, you know, the corporate style and then go teach yoga classes, which is fun. Um, I was a dancer and cheerleader at Arizona State. So after doing that, um, I wanted to stay kind of in that fitness, active lifestyle. So I love um, yoga sculpt, which is the form I teach at Core Power. And yeah, it's kind of a cool way to express myself outside of um, the office. Yeah. I'm going to pull up some rapid fire questions here that I have. Let's do it. (laughs) Rapid fire. All right. This is the rapid fire round (laughs) with Ashton. I'm ready. We didn't do this with Byron, but we'll, uh, we'll do this going forward. I think it's important to see how what people really think about these things. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Texting or phone call? Phone call. Favorite day of the week? Sunday. Why? It's just so relaxing and ch- I like going to church and I don't know. Day off. Sun- day off. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Favorite city in the United States besides any that you've lived? Ooh, uh, that's hard. Rapid fire. Um, Napa. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had you stumped. Yes. Last song you listened to? Um, this is embarrassing, but I think it was, it was Justin Bieber, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) which I think it was thought of you, Justin Bieber. That's just rapid fire. Okay. Uh, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world fluently or be able to talk to animals? Every language in the world. Why? I even, I sit next to Hannah, the director of marketing, and she was speaking Spanish earlier and I just wish I could communicate to more people and if i travel i could just understand and not be confused i don't know (laughs) invisibility or super strength invisibility and what's your go-to social media platform i hate to say it love instagram (laughs) still on the gram love the gram (laughs) (laughs) all right cool well that's ashton she's awesome and if you ever reach out to Directive, you'll probably at some point come in contact with her or she'll come in contact with you. So yeah, hit me up. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, right. Ashton. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to Yours in Marketing. I'm Blake Emmel. If you would please do us the favor of subscribing to the podcast if you found value in this and tell your friends, tell other B2B leaders, tell people that need to hear about this. If you have a website, if you are in marketing or out of marketing, if you just want to learn how to build your website, how to build your business online, or if you just want to learn more about interesting people in general in the B2B space, please subscribe to this podcast.